Um, so welcome everybody. This is very, very exciting. Uh, welcome to our IG Live today, Debt Real Talks. We've got an awesome guest. And do you have your guest with you today? <laughs> Actually, she was here. She was sitting here beside me. I did take a photo. So okay. we can tweet that afterwards. But yes, my yeah. special guest was here and I don't know where she's gone. She'll, she'll probably pop up again. Later. You'll have to tell us about your special guest. But I would <laughs> love to just welcome you, Elizabeth. And I would, I'm so excited for you to share with us, first of all, just a little bit about who you are and, um, you know, a little bit maybe even about your background. Let's start with that. And then we'll get talking into like the crux of things. So let's start with, you know, who you are. Give us your, you know, elevator pitch. <laughs> oh, that's such a loaded question. Uh, I work on Bay Street. I have worked on Bay Street. This is going to be my 24th year. And prior oh. to Bay Street, I actually worked in television broadcasting. And so I was behind the scenes working with stopwatches. And at that time, uh, the show that I was on was going to be canceled. And this is when the internet was coming on. This is when um, you look at all the new specialty channels were coming on board as well. And so the world right. was changing and I couldn't wrap my brain around the fact that if there are X amount of advertising dollars, now yes. you've got stations that will be, you know, vying for the same amount of those advertising dollars. So right. I was terrified of finance, didn't understand it, didn't want to understand it. I actually wanted to do fashion. And yeah. I, as part of my severance, I asked for them to sign me up for the Canadian securities course. Oh, so I did my exams. Yeah, I did all that stuff. And it, you know what? It was just trying to stay afloat with what was happening at that time. Right. And so for the past 20 years, I have had different shows. Uh, Rogers Television, Cable 10, used to have community programming. So right. I would do an hour live phone-in show <laughs> and fill in for Linda Leatherdale and fill in for Patricia Lovett Reed. That's, you know, the CTV business editor now. Yes. Uh, then the show got canceled and then they contacted me and said, can you come back again? So I did some more community TV. And wow. in 2016, Rogers had actually changed the mandate for broadcasting. They closed community television. <clears throat> and in 2018, I decided to start my own show called Finances Personal, geared yes. towards women, because women make less money than men. So we make 87 cents to the dollar. We live longer than men, so we have less money to survive on, especially when we are retiring. Right. We live longer. And women have a very disruptive work career. You know, men start and then they, they continue on until they retire. Women start working. They are, you know, going up to that glass ceiling then they have to stay at home and take care of children. Then they go back again right. and they have to start try to move up again. Then they are at home again, whether it's another child, whether it's, you know, their parents are ill. So right. uh, this is why I wanted to focus on women. The other thing was, you know, every time I would look at television, it was all male dominated. Right. And women to me are, you know, brighter, smarter, um, so many <laughs> wonderful aspects to them. And I wanted to showcase yeah. women with all of their brains and beauty. Oh, I love that. I know I'm with you. I remember growing up, you know, we didn't, we didn't really see ourselves on TV, especially, you know, for me being a minority as well. Like I really did not see myself on TV, but there, that very much so women we're not seeing other women on TV in those roles, in that anchor role, in that broadcaster role, you know, maybe in some other roles, but not in that role. So I think that's, <clears throat> it's fantastic. And that, you know, answered my first question. Why did you start finances personal? And why do you but focus Taz, on women? If I may just add, you know, <clears throat> this, this whole thing about women, I remember when I started in broadcasting, I was told, well, if you want to go on air, you need to change your last name because no one will hire you with the last name of Namofsky. And I'm first generation. My parents are immigrants. I'm the first one yes. born outside of, you know, Macedonia. And 
I was told that I would never get hired until, you know, unless I had changed my last name. And did you do that for broadcast ever? I mean, I know your name is, I see that you're nope. Nomofsky, but, ah, yep. Yep. and that, yeah, that's so, it's really, really interesting what those norms are and what we get told. And that, you know, we were, you and I were talking a little bit about COVID earlier as well. And um, a recent University of Calgary study showed that women suffered more than men during COVID when it came to things like mental health, insomnia, anxiety, depression. Um, you know, we're at home, we're isolated. It's impacting our mental health, which then really makes us, I guess, you know, pray even to things, you know, when your mental health isn't as strong as it used to be, um, some of our processing goes sideways, right? So then we can become really prey to things like fraud that maybe, you know, in normal situations, maybe you wouldn't have fallen prey to. But I think, you know, specifically for women, feeling that, and like you say, a lot of women have children, and they've got their parents they're looking after. We're in that sandwich generation. You're at home. There's fatigue. You're, you know, you're working all the time. You're dealing with family. So maybe we can talk a little bit about this, you know, fraud and how that kind of relates to women specifically. And, you know, in, in, we're not completely out of the dark yet. Most of us are still working from home or in isolation. So let's talk a little bit about fraud, fraud prevention, you know, how we can kind of deal with that in the current situation we're in. You know, that, that's a really good question. But what I do want to say is, you know, women have always had these situations, whether it was looking for right. child care, as I said, not, not making enough money. The only thing is COVID just brought it to the forefront and that made people talk about it, which right. is good. Because I agree. Because now all of a sudden people are saying women have been hit the hardest. Yes, they have, but they've always been hit the hardest during every recession Amen. or whatever. And I remember uh, giving a speech, um, I think it was for International Women's Day. And I said, you know, when my mother came to Canada, she was a cleaning lady. And what did yep. she do? Grabbed me in her arms, grabbed my food, grabbed my, my uh, diapers, and went off to work because she didn't have child care. And, right. you know, she wasn't making as much money as all, all of the men at that time. So the only thing that, you know... I think has changed is, well, she didn't have a cell phone. She doesn't have social media, so she couldn't do this. And she was hand washing right. all diapers. So, you know, I think that's about the only difference if you look at what women have been through. But, you know, talking about fraud, I, it's interesting. I did a show on fraud in 2018 with Jennifer Horner, who's the acting sergeant at Peel Region right now. Oh. And the show, we talked about different aspects of fraud. That show now has almost 11,000 views, and those views have ramped up because of COVID. So I decided in January to do something on fraud because I interviewed a woman called um, Linda Young and her sister, Shelly Frost. And Linda okay. was in love, in love with an incredible man who was building their beautiful home in Cuba and he just kept asking her for iPads and iPhones and money and more money because he was building their beautiful home. Mm -hmm. She was actually defrauded $50,000. And this is a woman who does not have $150,000 to give away to anybody. This is something that she would need for her retirement. Right. So we all want to be loved. We all want that. Yeah. We all want, you know, our person, right? But we all have to sit back and think about it and say, okay, if this is my person, have I met him? Is yes. he making any monetary demands of me? Does he want me to send him iPads, iPhones, gift cards, whatever it is? Right. Um, has he tried to meet me and then there's been a family emergency and he's canceled on me? Because remember, in the olden days, <coughs> you know, you would get... Um, defrauded by swindlers and and grifters yeah. right and yeah. they would get to know you and they would go out with you and you they would date you and court you and really get a chance to know you and build upon that trust and now That's it's right. all online right so this is a exactly. very different way of doing it and the problem is when you are being courted by a new person your person yeah. it could be they, this person could be anywhere in the world professing their love to you. 
So yes. you need to make sure that you have a solid, solid relationship with them. It's the same thing. There were so many scans going on right now during COVID. So right. many people were looking at um, rentals and they would see a place online, meet somebody and give them cash at, you know, a coffee shop or whatever and lose all their money. People were, you know, people wanted a companion because they were self-isolated, working from home. So they would want to get whatever dog they could find at a kennel. And these right. kennels didn't really exist. They were just photos. Just like the photos of, you know, your person online dating, right? You have to make yes. sure that that person is alive and real and not just a conglomerate of scammers and fraudsters tag teaming off of each other, professing their love for you. Because it's typically right. like 10 people or whatever, and they just keep, keep on, you know, telling you how wonderful you are and how great you are. Well, and I'm, I'm so glad you're bringing this up and even talking about the $150,000 because, you know, I, through the work that I do as well, have heard of a story of um, two, and, and I, I guess I want to, I want to demystify this a little bit because I think when we think about, especially the romance fraud, <clears throat> I think we tend to think that this is somebody young and naive and they're just, you know, they're just not, um, they're not really worldly or whatnot. And that's, not the case the two women that i know of were very very high executives so it's it's a very sophisticated operation as you say there could be 10 12 people it's not just this one individual you think you're speaking to um and and you know even though it's done over line i i do believe they do win they do develop a bit of a relationship and win that trust over and it's it's little things that seem very, it's not an obvious thing. Like, hey, can you send me 10 iPads? It's usually, you know, they're sort of, they're building it. So it's, it's really tough to even detect these frauds. But I think even having these conversations, even talking about, like you say, the rental fraud, the pet fraud obviously has been huge through COVID. And so, you know, not to say, to not look for these things and it, it you know online is the everything's virtual these days but it's just having those extra checks and balances having those you know finding a way to double check and reconfirm and you know are there any tips you have on how do we avoid fraud in this online virtual world so that's that's a really really good question and one of the things i wanted to say was um it doesn't matter how smart you are it doesn't yeah. matter how hip you are or how um, in tune you are. The, these frauds are emotions of the heart. And right. we all have emotion, right? Whether it's for um, a, a child, like there's the grandfather fraud where they call you up and they say, oh my gosh, your grandson or your granddaughter is in the hospital. We need $6,000 in order to operate <sighs> right now. And then, you know, the grandparent says, okay, put Jimmy on the phone. And then they actually say the name, so the fraudsters know the name. And nice. then they say, well, put them on the phone. And when the kid's on the phone, they say, the grandparent says, well, you don't really sound like yourself. They're like, oh, my gosh, his nose was broken. His jaw's broken. He does, he's not speaking properly. Send us the money ASAP. So it's all, mm. uh, it's all about the heart and how you're feeling. The romance yes. scam. When I spoke to Linda Young, she's the one who was defrauded in $150,000. She actually said she put too much information about herself online. She said she was newly divorced. She said that she'd been married for X amount of years. She had children. She said that she had an executive job. So, you know, when, right. when they see that you have an executive job, you know, all of a sudden they start thinking, you know, dollar signs, signs, right? <laughs> dollar signs. Yeah. So, you have to be very careful. You have to be very skeptical. Uh, skeptical. Skepti I can't even speak properly. Uh, <laughs> be skeptical. Uh, and make sure that I always say stop, pause, think. And then if yeah. it's an email, delete. If it's a phone call saying we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to arrest you, hang up. Hang up the phone. No one's coming to arrest you. In Canada, they will not come and arrest you. And I started uh, this uh, fraud awareness in foreign languages. I started it for finances personal, mm -hmm. and then I took it over to the corporate world where uh, it 
I recorded little messages in different languages. I had different people, whether it was friends or coworkers, talk about it. And, and basically telling immigrants and seniors that if you get these phone calls, these CRA phone calls saying that they oh. will arrest you or press one and, and, and you know, we, we can discuss it and you can give us a payment. In Canada, the RCMP is not going to knock on your door and, and arrest you because you think that you owe the government money. That's not going right. to happen here. However, you have so many immigrants that have come from countries like this. And so they're terrified when they get fraudulent phone calls like this and the scammers Absolutely. are them. So I always say stop, <laughs> pause, think, delete, hang up, whatever. And you know when in doubt, call a friend. Pick up the yeah. phone and say, hey, this is what happened to me. What do you think? Do you think I should pursue it? Do you think I should just ignore it? What do you think? Yeah. And, and the bottom line is, if you have become a victim of fraud, if you have been scammed and you've given somebody money, call the local police department and call the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. Those are the two places that you need to call and, and, and talk to. The other thing, too, is a lot of people during COVID have been selling to the secondhand market. They've yes, been looking yeah. through the closet. They've been downsizing. <laughs> they've been looking at furniture, thinking, okay, I don't need this sofa anymore. I'm going to sell it. I don't need this watch anymore or this dress or this pair of shoes, whatever it is. Yes, GG. <laughs> yes. So when you go to exchange, Every police department has parking spaces designated yes. for secondhand switches because most of the time they want to meet you in a dark alley, in a park, or somewhere yes. and exchange yes. cash. And once you've exchanged the cash, you're never going to get it back again. So if you are going to participate in the whole secondhand market and you've got to switch over whatever the merchandise is, always go to your local police department because at least you know you're in a safe environment. And, and that goes for the seller. I know as a single woman, when I sell things, I never put my home address and I never have them pick it up at my home either. I do that. I meet them at the police office or at, you know, I meet them in a crowded, obvious space, even when I am the one selling the item because it's the same you know, same red flags. Oh, this was great. I think we could just spend the whole hour talking about fraud, but we don't have the whole hour. So <laughs> I want to make sure I want to make sure our audience gets as much value out of this as they can. And you just you have so many wonderful things that I want to ask you about. So sticking kind of in this line of the pandemic and, you know, COVID, <clears throat> you know, during COVID, I, I feel like it's um, leveled off the playing field in some ways in terms of um, finances, right? I think there was a time pre-COVID that a lot of us just kind of felt like, well, this could never happen to me. I, you know, I got a safe, secure job. I'm never going to lose my job. I'm not going to have issues with my debt. I'm not going to have issues with, but you know, I know people, I know, you know, people in the six, seven figure income brackets. I know people that, you know, are on government assistance and everybody in between and everyone's been impacted in some way, Everyone. shape or form, yeah. right? And it's really brought to light, and I see people talking about it more, this idea of an emergency fund. It's really brought that to light. So I want to talk a little bit about emergency funds. You know, why is it even important to have one? How big does your emergency fund need to be? How do you start building an emergency fund if you're in the middle of a pandemic or, you know, money is already tight? Let's talk a little bit about emergency funds. So emergency funds are extremely important because COVID has shown this to us, right? Yes. How many, it goes from one end of the spectrum to the other. You're either struggling and having the worst time of your life or you are doing really, really well and COVID's been great for you. There right. hasn't been anything in between, but the majority of people have been hit really, really hard by COVID. If you don't have a job and you don't have serve and you don't have any other means of income, where are you going to go? And your debt. I mean, if you keep accumulating debt, it, there's no end to it. So emergency yeah. funds are really, really important. You know, they were always saying that three months worth of emergency fund would be really good to have. But my way I of remember thinking, learning that. You know, a lot of people say, well, if I only made more money, my debt would go away and I would, I would be happy and my life would be great. 
And right. I often ask the question, so if you have somebody who is making $50,000 a year and actually saves 10000 a year, and you have someone who makes $150,000 a year and spends one hundred and sixty, right? Who's better off? The one who's making fifty thousand and saving ten is richer than the person Absolutely. who's making more money. So I think you have to take a look at that. You know, look at the big picture because more money doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to live a better life. Yeah. So emergency funds. It all depends on how much you spend and what your lifestyle is like, right? I mean, yeah. if you lead a needs versus a wants life, you just buy what you need and you don't buy what you want. So your emergency fund can be a little bit smaller than someone else who just likes to do a lot of impulse shopping, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, I've often, <laughs> I often think that, um, you know, impulse shopping is more of a detriment than anything else. It gives you a short-term high, long-term debt, and it, it tries to fill a void that will never get filled, and it just yes. keeps depleting. Um, every yeah, November, there's that whole emotional side of shopping and debt and living above our means as well. It really isn't about how much money you make. It really is more about you know, our mindset, our habits, and our emotions, isn't it? You know, I, it's funny because I was talking to a few friends and, and I was saying that, you know, through COVID, I was cooking at home all the time. I probably ordered in five times because I enjoy wow. cooking and so does my husband. And then different friends I've talked to, you know, said, well, you know, we order on an app all the time, you know, three times a week, once a right. week, every day. And so, you know, it depends on what your lifestyle is and how big your emergency fund is going to be. Are you going to order in every night? Uh, every November, I start a $5 a day savings challenge for financial I love liberty. this. Yes. And I've, it's so funny because friends all over the world do it, and they get their children to start doing it. And, you know, you just take $5, you either put it in another bank account, you put it in a jar, you put it in a drawer, whatever it is, and it accumulates because by the end of the year, you've, came, uh, you've accumulated $1,825. In 10 years, it's over $18,000, right? And I, I have a chart that I, that I put together, and I'm just going to look at it right now. So if you save $5 per day, and you save that, well, let's say you, you buy your, your latte, whatever, $5 a day, whatever that is, plus a okay. $14 per day lunch. In five years, it's going to cost you $34,000. That's a lot of money. $34,000. Wow. And that's buying, buying a coffee, a $5 coffee <laughs> and buying a $14 per day lunch. But then if you add a $40 per week mani-pedi, in five years, you've spent $43,800. Wow. And then if you do... You know, $5 latte, $14 lunch, $40 per week mani-pedi. Then you add on an extra $200 per month eating out. In five years, you spent $55,800. Never mind the compounded interest. That's an that annual salary. <laughs> Not only is it an annual salary, but it's a great start for a down payment for a home that everybody is looking for right now. And everyone right. is saying that they don't have enough money for a down payment and they'll never be able to buy a home. And they'll never be able to again. save for it. Like there's this rhetoric of, oh, like now the down payment is 10%. There's no, how, how can anybody save that kind of money? And just listening to you right now, just sharing, you know, that in five years and, you know, it's interesting. We can, we sometimes can, um, we can downplay five years and sometimes we can really overplay five years, but really in five years, to be able to save $55,000, that's not chump change. And that does, you know, that can take you from never being able to own a home to being able to own a home. Yep. It's huge. So, so, you know, saving your money and putting it in a drawer or investing it, whatever it is that you do that you feel comfortable doing, will get you to that next level. But you have to be disciplined and you have to live a needs versus wants life. 
and yeah. you can't just say, you know, well, y- YOLO, you only live, uh, you only live once. Um, and, you know, FOMO, the fear of missing out. Oh my God, Taz, you just bought something. I need to go out and buy it as well because, it, you know, right. I want to have it because you have it. Um, I couldn't care less if you had it. I'd be happy for you. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we have to start thinking about ourselves and not trying to satisfy what we think we want because our friend or somebody else's has it. Yeah. Um, there's a saying of, you know, all you're doing is trying to impress people um, that, you know, don't know you, don't like you, don't respect you, but you're trying to earn the respect of these people. You're trying to impress these people that really have nothing to do with actually your life, right? And I think about, you know, like you, I I have immigrant parents as well. And I think of some of the things that they used to try to teach me back in the day that I just thought were, that's so not cool. I got to do what all my cool friends are are doing. (laughs) And now I'm like, oh my God, that was gold. Those were golden nuggets. Like we could really go back to some of those. So yeah, the value of an emergency fund and the value of just saving. And there's a, there's a term that you had coined that I really, I loved when we were talking. It was making, uh, you know, being fashionably Forget frugal. Fashionable. Yes. Can yeah. you making tell us what fashionable. that means and I, to you? I think and somebody how do we make created that, that. Oh, okay. I think somebody you created it. that. Like, <laughs> but in the 1920s or 30s or something, right? And yeah, I mean, I think it's okay. And I think it's really cool that I'm not spending a ton of money on, things that I don't need right now because you know quite frankly I'm focused on living a good life I'm focused on you know having a good retirement when the time comes you know I don't need to have um you know a pair of designer shoes because you have them um I don't need to put things on my credit card just because I want to have it you know my father always said to me cash is king if you can't afford it don't buy it Yes, and my so dad used to say cash why. is king too all the time. Right. Yeah, cash is king. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. And the thing is, I mean, I think we need to look at, you know, making frugality fashionable because it's cool to save money. It's cool to buy stuff on sale. Yes. Um, you know, I am thrilled when I buy, you know, three tops or whatever it is. And on the receipt, it says, you save nine hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, right. Yes. I don't have to pay regular price for anything, and that's another thing I wanted to talk about. There are some individuals out there that will look at a thousand dollar purse and think that's a thousand dollar purse. But if I can get it at seventy percent off plus an extra twenty percent off or whatever, yes. and I end up paying one hundred and fifty dollars for it, I'm proud that I found this piece of purse that was actually a thousand dollars but a lot of people look at it and think oh it's a 150 dollar purse it's not that good anymore and i think we (laughs) need to change our mindset and and yeah make frugality fashionable did you ever work in retail because i used to work i was in management in retail and i remember we would have 90 percent off sales liz 90 percent off how can a big chain put things on at 90 percent off Do you think they're losing money? There's no way. They wouldn't still be around. So if they can sell it at 90% and still make a profit and still have all these bricks and mortars, why on earth are you paying 100%? Ever since I worked in retail, I will tell you, I never, ever buy anything at full price, ever. It's it's a rule for me. And my sister and I, I, we compare. I got this for $10. I got it for, you know, $5 or whatever. Like, we actually compare... Who got the better deal? Like it is all about getting the deal, which that can turn into a slippery slope. If you're, if you're kind of a victim to, oh, it's on sale, I must get it. Like we still have to live a needs versus want lifestyle, right? And I agree with that because I, uh, you know, my, my parents are snowbirds, so I would go down and see them in Florida. And yeah. I remember, um, you know, I, I'd go shopping with my mom and my mom's friend was with her and she said, Oh my gosh, you know, here's a pair of pants or eight dollars on sale for eight dollars, whatever the number was. Yeah. And this woman came in and said, Eight dollars, you should buy two of them. It's it's the price of a martini. Huh. But <laughs> who cares what the price is if it's just going to be hanging in your closet and you're not going to wear it? Right. So even if it is eight dollars, are you going to wear it? 
right? right. I, are you going to appreciate it or you just bought it for the sake of buying it because the price was pretty remarkable, but it's just going to be hanging out in your closet collecting dust and then you're going to try to resell them somewhere on... Or maybe a dollar whatever. if you're lucky. <laughs> So yeah. you have to think about that as well. Just because it's a deal doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to use it, you're going to like it, you're going to um, appreciate it. Or that you need to stock up just because it's on a deal. If you were looking for the one pair of pants and they're on sale, get the one pair of pants. It doesn't mean you need to buy 10 pairs. And that, I'm so guilty of that past me, okay? Uh -oh. um, we are. don't have a lot of time left. There's one question I really, really want to ask you. And it's this okay. idea. I remember learning about this. I think, I think it was in my university days, this concept of women leaning in, right? That was a big buzzword. Lean in, women, lean in. And it seemed to me, it felt to me like that was around the boardroom and in business and in, you know, taking, you know, charge of my career. Um, but there's something to be said about women leaning in, in our home life, in our personal life. I know for me, when I was married, um, so we were both in banking and he was doing his certified financial planning designation. We were both budgeters we were both like in control of our finances and then we got married and he did it his way and I did it my way and we were clashing a little bit and so you know we decided one person should probably take charge and I gave that to my husband and then promptly went and stuck my head in the sand basically like I just I stopped checking bank statements and you know I just really checked out and I was not leaning in I was so leaning in in my career but I was not leaning in in my personal life and in my personal finances. So what do you have to say about that, this idea of women leaning in in their personal lives? So a few things. You just talked about the fact that you weren't looking at your statements. I just wrote a blog about, you know, do you actually read your monthly credit card statements? Because, yes. you know, how many, how many subscriptions are you signed up for and how many do you realize that you're signed up for and how much has how have those subscriptions gone up mm -hmm. in price? And, you know, you want to talk about leaning in for yourself. Um, I was looking at my credit card statements and I noticed that the alarm system went from, you know, $20, $20 $25, whatever, to $45. And so I called them up and I said, you know, I've decided I'm going to go with somebody else because you practically doubled the price. Yeah. And so we negotiated and I negotiated back down to the previous price and I got a brand new alarm system, state of the art, brand new alarm system. But, but if you hadn't checked and read your statement, you would never have caught that. Right. And how many things have you actually canceled? <clears throat> but you're still mm. being charged. I mean, there's yeah. so many things that your credit card statement will tell you. But I wanted to tell you one story that you were saying about leaning in. Yeah. There's one year that I had water coming in through the ceiling of my house. And at that time, there was the yellow pages. I went through the yellow pages. I called this dude to come over. He came in, <laughs> stranger in my house. I had to go up to one of the bedrooms. I was standing in one of the bedrooms with him. That's where the attic was. And he said, yeah. well, I've got to go up to the attic and I've got to go take a look. And I said, well, I'm coming up with you. And he said, what? And wow. I said, well, it's my house. I've never been up there. It's a room I've never been in. So let's go. So I climbed yeah. up and I'm crawling in, you know, in the attic. And he's telling me how brutal it is and how this has to be done and this has to be done and this has to be done. And, you know, it's a problem, blah, blah, blah. So we come down and we're standing in one of the bedrooms. And I said to him, okay, so how much do you think this is going to cost me? Yeah. And he said, probably around $40,000. And I said, well, $40,000 is a bit excessive for a roof, don't you think? And he said, well, you can afford it. You work on Bay Street. Oh. And I said, well, how do you know where I work? He said, well, I've seen you on TV before. And I said, it doesn't matter where I work. It doesn't mean that I have a special bank account with $40,000 sitting and waiting for you. So what right. I want you to do is I need you to give me a three-part um, submission of what you think needs to be done. Part one is emergency. Part two, you know, will have to be done soon. And then part three is down the road. Why don't you fax it to me or send, send it at that time it was a fax machine. Send right. me. Uh, send me what you think is important and then I will go forward with it. And I never heard from him again. 
as women, we need to stand up and we need to ask questions. My mother always yes. said, if you don't ask, you don't know. Ask the questions. Never be afraid of asking questions. And the bottom line is, you know, I know I will never, ever fail at anything because I surround myself with pretty incredible people. And if yes. I don't know something, one of my friends will know. And I'll pick up the phone, I'll text, whatever it is. If yes. I don't know, I ask. So what do we need to do? We need to negotiate for ourselves. If you are being charged something on your credit card, like a regular subscription, yeah. call them up and try to negotiate. Try to lower it. Always advocate for yourself. Try to put money away for an emergency fund. This will be really, really good because you know what? This is our first pandemic, but who knows? We may get a second one or how long this will last. Like nobody knows. I mean, everybody's yes. just trying to figure things out as we go, right? So, you know, don't get stuck in FOMO YOLO. Live a disciplined <laughs> and frugal life. And if you Absolutely. can't pay off your credit card, do not just pay the minimum. You know, if you have $1,000 on your credit card and you only pay the minimum, it will take you... What is it here? I think it's seven years, seven years and eight months to pay it off. Is a thousand dollars? That's only for a thousand dollars. Yeah, it actually nine hundred and fifty-five dollars and ninety-four cents. Always look at the sidebar on your credit card yes. statement. It'll tell you how long it'll take if you only pay the minimum. Like you should right. never pay only the minimum. Always advocate for yourself. So great. Oh my God, Elizabeth, I, we need another session like this because this was not enough time. But for all of our viewers today, how do they find you? How do they follow you? How do they, how do they get to take, you know, absorb more of this? You know, you talked about a blog you've written. How do we find you? So I have a, uh, my website is financeispersonal.ca, financeispersonal.ca. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at E. Namofsky, and so it's at E-N-A-U-M-O-V-S-K-I, and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. On YouTube, it is Finance is Personal for Women, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. Reach out yeah. to me, DM me. I will, I will respond to you, and um, I'll have a conversation with you. I can vouch for that because I reached out to you on LinkedIn and you responded and here we are today. So Liz, thank you so much. You are a light, I feel, for women, women mm -hmm. in finance, you know, this um, make, you know, fashionably frugal. I just, I want to just take that. I want to splatter that everywhere. Let's make being frugal cool again because it is, it actually is cool. Um, and yeah, follow and like and connect with Liz, financespersonal.ca. Um, check her out, check out her blogs and, uh, you know, let us know in the comments, let us know in the future if you want to see Liz back on and uh, we'll make it happen. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to come back again. I can talk for another hour. So I'd love to come Thank back. Thank you. You are wonderful. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you everyone for coming today. Have a marvelous Monday evening and be fashionably frugal, everyone. <laughs> make frugality fashionable. Take care. Yes. Thanks. Bye.